thank you for for being here to, today is the second day and the last day and we have a very packed uh, uh, list of papers but we will start with an invited talk and my pleasure to introduce daniela paolotti uh, she's a research leader at the isi foundation in torino italy and she has been working on uh, interdisciplinary data science approach, mainly exactly what we are doing here, Web for Good, the data science for good, especially in complex systems, network science, applied mathematics, uh, and behavioral science, in particular uh, epidemiology. And today we will listen and learn about how to do data science for good. Uh, Daniela, thanks for coming. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ricardo. It's a great, great pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you to Ricardo, Gina, and Chiara for the nice invitation to um, give my presentation today. Uh, I think uh, it's a, a very much uh, needed uh, um, uh, special track, in, uh, especially these days. So I'm quite happy to, to join this first edition and hopefully uh, there will be many others in the years uh, to come. So I hope you can hear me well. Um, let me just uh, share my screen so that uh, I, um, I have some slides uh, uh, to present. Uh, and please feel free to ask questions uh, or to, to really write down any comment uh, on the chat and I will do my best to uh, address any comment you might have. So um, today I would like to um, talk about uh, our experience uh, um, at ISI Foundation in uh, how to use uh, data science for, for social good. What are the, um, the let's say, challenges, but also um, the, the, the gains, the, the new approaches that uh, we have uh, uh, discovered over the years, and um, in the end, uh, how um, organizations, research uh, organizations uh, like ISA Foundation, but uh, like many others uh, in the world, can, can really have an impact in the uh, realm of social good in collaboration with the, um, humanitarian institutions, governmental institutions, uh, and so on and so forth. So this is a, a, a slide, a, a picture that is uh, quite familiar, I'm sure, for all of you. These are the sustainable development goals uh, created by uh, the United Nations um, to uh, really tackle the societal challenges that uh, affect uh, our um, world, our uh, society. And um, they have been uh, used uh, to uh, really create uh, uh, targeted studies, targeted interventions, and um, especially in the in the area of um, web for good or data science for social good, these uh, sustainable development goals are used to somehow characterize the areas in which one wants to, to, have, uh, to have an impact. So um, the issues that you want to tackle go from uh, no poverty to good health, to gender equality, uh, climate related actions, uh, uh, peace and justice uh, and partnerships for all the goals. So it's a very diverse uh, set of, um, of goals that have been uh, created uh, uh, back in, uh, I think, uh, more than a decade ago, and that are basically the roadmap on which many activities of humanitarian agencies, as well as governments, as well as the United Nations, uh, uh, are based. Um, Data science for social impact, what, it, what it is, what, what do we mean when uh, we, th we think and we speak about social good, social impact? Well, um, we have uh, uh, in mind what it means to do data science, to do network science um, or uh, complex systems. And uh, there is a, a set of uh, interdisciplinary approaches related not only to collecting uh, 
for example, non-traditional data sources that can complement uh, open and governmental uh, data, like, for example, imagine census data from um, countries all over the world, but also all the interdisciplinary tools that go into the modeling of this data, uh, ranging from uh, approaches like mathematical modeling, machine learning, natural language processing, uh, network science, and computational social science. So I'm mentioning just a few of the interdisciplinary approaches that, uh, um, let's say, comprise uh, uh, what we mean when we talk about data science. And uh, over the past, uh, um, I would say, five to six years, these interdisciplinary approaches have been used to uh, address a series of uh, um, diverse domains um, that uh, uh, try to uh, somehow uh, bring together um, actors from their research and academic areas with people that work in humanitarian response, people that deal with epidemiology and population health, or that have to create policies to address unemployment and poverty, or imagine all the studies devoted to the future of cities, to, to um, making cities smart, uh, and so on and so forth. So we have seen uh, a growing um, uh, really number of uh, uh, studies, uh, initiatives uh, that try to combine uh, these interdisciplinary set of tools coming from the science to address uh, these diverse uh, um, sets of problems. And um, uh, in particular, the, uh, let's say, nexus, the node of the um, of this uh, of this kind of uh, let's say uh, contamination between data science and uh, let's say the humanitarian the humanitarian sector revolves mainly uh, around data as you might uh, imagine i mentioned the fact that um, non traditional data sources that try to complement uh, more traditional governmental sources are what basically uh, have uh, empowered the use of data science. We can apply machine learning and deep learning and uh, network science thanks to the fact that uh, we have an abundance of digital data generated by the activities of individuals uh, with digital platforms, with mobile devices on an unprecedented scale that uh, really have uh, unlocked the power of data science. So the, 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 the whole situation revolves around data. Data are usually uh, owned by uh, really a diverse set of actors. It can be private companies, uh, imagine the big techs, but not only, of course, for example, um, mobile, uh, um, uh, mobile connectivity providers uh, uh, like, uh, I don't know, Vodafone or Telefonica, but even the public sector. The public sector generates uh, really abundant uh, data, uh, not always in a digital form, that, can, that could, in principle, be exploited uh, for uh, all sorts of, uh, of purposes. Uh, usually, there is a research community that provides uh, expertise and uh, methodologies, but in the end, the problem owners are none of these two. The problem owners are usually global agencies. We have seen the United Nations with the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, global agencies like um, the World Food Program, uh, UNICEF, uh, UN Global Pulse, all these uh, uh, global actors that uh, try to um, address, uh, as I said, many of the uh, global issues that, uh, uh, for example, go under the umbrella of the Sustainable Development Goal. But even a single uh, governments or nonprofit organization all the way to the um, single municipalities, for example. Um, cities in Europe have become uh, one of the main, uh, uh, let's say, actors uh, for um, data owners or research uh, uh, institutions when it comes to devising solutions uh, for policies that uh, might, might make uh, a city uh, more efficient, more enjoyable, 
and uh, let's say future proof. So there is this, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, we call uh, issue of data collaborations uh, that uh, somehow brings together different actors uh, around data, around problems and around methodologies. And uh, different actors can really bring different ingredients. And the challenges basically are related to the fact that uh, um, we have to bring together a really diverse set of um, uh, of, um, of entities if we want to uh, somehow address problems uh, uh, that have an actual impact in an effective way. So one of the um, let's say uh, more uh, relevant challenge is related to the lack of skills. So in this community, in particular, the, the, really the, the web conference community, uh, we have many people that um, are at the sweet spot uh, uh, between uh, a set of uh, uh, interdisciplinary and uh, diverse um, uh, domains. So computational methods, maths and statistics, machine learning, domain expertise, um, all these, uh, uh, let's say, fields and domains are um, what create the unique skills that are needed to do data science. And we all know that these uh, set of skills are not easily found outside, for example, this kind of community, especially in the humanitarian sector, um, it's not easy to find the people who have uh, the right set of skills, but also the domain expertise that is needed to tackle and understand uh, uh, problems in the humanitarian sector. And additionally, um, let's say together with the issue related to the lack of skills, uh, there is also the problem related to the access of data. So as I mentioned, um, what really makes data science possible is that the fact that uh, nowadays we, we have the possibility to, to generate uh, a, a, an incredibly uh, large amount of digital data, usually related to the, the fact that people use uh, digital platforms, uh, so imagine all social media or search engines or, um, for example, Wikipedia. Uh, or mobile phones data uh, that are generated by the fact that we use uh, a mobile device so uh, companies can track our position, can track our interactions in terms of uh, text messages or uh, phone calls. But these data are commercial data, they sit in the belly of private companies. They are highly, highly sensitive, so uh, all the issues related to privacy and ethics uh, are really in the way of uh, uh, using these data for research purposes. But on the other hand, we know that these are big and fast data, so they are generated continuously by the fact that people interact with digital and mobile platforms and they have a resolution in time and space that uh, uh, really could unlock, uh, unlock some of the most advanced uh, data science uh, approaches. So these, uh, uh, let's say, interdisciplinary, uh, non-traditional set of skills and uh, data needs and data, um, more than needs, uh, data possibilities, are really the unique challenges that affect not only data science in general, but data science for social impact. Um, because we are bringing together uh, really diverse fields in which these two uh, aspects might uh, still lack and might still not be uh, available. On the other hand, uh, these challenges are very well known since uh, uh, quite some time and um, uh, global uh, agencies uh, like, for example, the uh, data science division of the United Nations called the UN Global Pulse um, have been uh, leveraging uh, these non-traditional data sources and partnerships with uh, big techs, for example, to really try and create uh, uh, different studies, different um, uh, use cases to, to show how, uh, for example, big data could be used uh, um, to address uh, issues like, for example, gender equality. This is a, a screenshot of um, 
uh, of the page of uh, UN Global Pulse, where the latest news uh, uh, back in 2018 was the fact that the UN Secretary General um, creates a panel on digital cooperation. So already uh, a few years ago, there was the awareness that we need to create this kind of panels, this kind of uh, um, expert uh, groups uh, to, to really uh, bring together uh, data experts, data science experts, uh, and uh, pr problem uh, uh, owners. And um, these are, let's say, I, I wanted to mention this because these are the, the pioneering initiatives uh, that uh, already back in 2018 um, really tried to, uh, to, to address the challenges that I mentioned. And another great example was the Data for Good Exchange Conference uh, that I think is, not, um, uh, is no longer organized. Uh, I think it was, uh, um, let's say, discontinued right before the pandemic. And it was a, a conference um, created by Bloomberg that uh, for the first time brought together uh, data scientists, but also people from um, non-governmental organizations, humanitarian, the humanitarian sector, um, to really um, showcase uh, studies and initiatives that were working on data science for uh, social impact or, or social good. It was um, a great conference where one of the um, really first pioneering studies were uh, created. And uh, uh, also already uh, back in 2019, the OECD um, created a, a center on philanthropy focused on the data and analysis for development. So again, data science and um, uh, analytics and data-driven activities to really tackle development-related um, issues. Um, and last but not least, the AI for Good Global Summit that still take pl takes place uh, every year in uh, Geneva that is supported by the ITU, which is uh, the um, uh, largest uh, network of telcos uh, um, in, in the world. And that is really aimed at uh, um, providing, a, let's say, a AI related framework for sustainable development goals uh, oriented uh, activities. So this is just to show you that uh, um, the let's say uh, the, the the will the idea to to use the data science for social impact is something that goes back uh, a few years and that has already seen uh, several initiatives uh, um, in, uh, in in several situations. Even uh, European um, authorities have felt the need to somehow provide. Um, a, a framework, a legal framework or a regulatory framework uh, related to data sharing. And this is a, a, a report on the European strategy for business to government data sharing for the public interest. Basically, this, um, uh, let's say, um, this activity is uh, aiming at filling uh, a market failure that somehow uh, is uh, uh, really failing uh, to uh, generate uh, public value from uh, uh, privately owned data. These data, um, as I mentioned, uh, digital data that are generated by public uh, by private companies, in the end are generated by the public. So they are generated by citizens, by uh, the general population. What is the return for the general population with respect to to the fact that they provide the companies with this data. And so the idea for this um, um, European uh, uh, strategy is to really create a way for the uh, European uh, um, authorities uh, with, in collaboration with the private uh, uh, companies uh, to generate, uh, um, let's say, uh, a return uh, for, for the public uh, uh, or through the data that they, that they create, still keeping the business uh, uh, plans or the business interests of the companies uh, in, into account. So the idea is that these companies 
really need to, uh, to make profit and what is the best way to um, extract the knowledge that can improve um, uh, the public interest from this data while still uh, providing profit for these companies. And this is important if we want to use uh, these uh, privately owned data for the public interest. And uh, um, this is uh, also a, um, the Data Governance Act that is basically a proposal for a regulation on European data governance that came out uh, at the end of 2020. And that is now really uh, the, the reference uh, uh, for future uh, roadmaps that uh, somehow are aimed at um, creating more effective data sharing mechanisms uh, between uh, private companies, uh, private actors, uh, and uh, uh, gov uh, governments and uh, European uh, authority. On the other hand, uh, uh, even the philanthropic sector is uh, becoming more and more aware of the importance of, uh, of data and of uh, uh, data science um, for social good. This is uh, um, an initiative uh, that you might have heard of that was launched, uh, I think, uh, three years ago. It's called the data.org and is um, sustained, uh, sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation. And uh, it's a, a very interesting initiative that um, provides uh, small grants, uh, small uh, um, uh, really uh, support uh, to uh, projects, for example, not, not only small, but even, even very big, uh, to projects that are aimed to, to have a societal impact. For example, very recently, they uh, granted uh, a, um, a large uh, uh, chunk of money to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, if I am not mistaken, uh, to create uh, uh, a pandemic preparedness uh, um, plan for low and middle income countries uh, um, in the upcoming years. So uh, even the philan with, of course, uh, uh, data and data science. So even the philanthropic sector is uh, uh, exploiting, is um, becoming more and more aware of the potential that data and data science can bring to uh, the field. Um, this is also uh, another initiative by the Patrick uh, McGovern Foundation uh, that was launched, uh, I think, at the end of 2021, uh, a data and society uh, initiative uh, um, that, uh, again, was uh, uh, aimed at uh, creating um, support uh, for initiatives related to data, tech-driven initiatives uh, for, uh, for social good. And then uh, even Fondation Bodnar, it's a Swiss uh, uh, foundation that is investing in um, creating uh, uh, case studies and, um, and um, initiatives related to AI and digital technologies <clears throat> with a focus on the health and well-being of children and young people uh, in urban environments. So many um, philanthropic uh, institutions uh, are creating uh, data-driven, uh, data-based, uh, data-related, uh, AI-related uh, uh, initiatives with different focus um, because they recognize the importance uh, of, uh, uh, of this kind of uh, interdisciplinary uh, activities. But uh, what can we do as, uh, um, as a community? So in the end, we, ha we have seen that uh, basically the world is changing around us and uh, there are many different uh, um, initiatives from many different sides, from many different uh, directions. What can we do as a community? And uh, uh, the idea in this uh, presentation was uh, to, to really try and see how the, the community of uh, the web conference uh, or of the data scientists uh, that revolve around the, um, the web conference uh, could contribute uh, to this uh, uh, line of, um, uh, of activities. So, uh, for example, we could uh, um, work together in creating uh, um, explainable models uh, and computationally effective models based on uh, um, non-traditional data streams. I mentioned mobile phone data, but 
also, of course, the social media data, digital data in general, uh, that could somehow uh, help in the identification of needs, the targeting of interventions, and evaluation of impact. This is uh, very important. So we can support the decision makers or the problem owners in shedding light uh, to um, uh, different aspects of different problems, but also in uh, providing solutions in terms of uh, uh, models, uh, suggested interventions, but also uh, a way to somehow evaluate the impact in a scientific, uh, um, scientifically sound uh, fashion. Um, the fact that data science can help in uh, handling uh, uh, really large uh, and untamable, um, uh, let's say, amount of data uh, could really um, support, uh, um, again, problem owners and policy makers in addressing uh, very uh, complex and uh, uh, large scale problems. Uh, we, we could, um, with the fact that uh, digital science is uh, uh, let's say used to deal with uh, uh, really um, population level data from the web, from digital platforms, and uh, is capable of dealing with the uh, humans that generate data. This really can help uh, uh, support uh, uh, governments or um, global agencies in uh, in really providing a way to to handle this uh, this kind of uh, uh, societal uh, and and uh, and environmental problems, and um, the fact that uh, uh, data science has a scientific approach it means that. Uh, uh, we can provide uh, models uh, and um, solutions that are scientifically sound, that can be reproduced, uh, can be verified, uh, whose explainability, accountability is transparent and clear, and that uh, uh, will lead to a communication of decisions uh, that is uh, very effective and, um, and very transparent. So uh, the, the goal is uh, to provide solutions that have a very strong and robust scientific base. And uh, in the end, the interventions uh, and the, the uh, solutions that uh, data science uh, can help with have a uh, science-driven uh, um, approach so that uh, governments can really rely on something that uh, uh, is uh, strong and robust and that can be fully verified. And the inherent interdisciplinary of data science is ideal to uh, respond to complex crises in, um, in situations where you, where you have interplay of many different uh, um, factors, many different uh, uh, entities or, uh, or actors. Uh, I mean, at the beginning, I mentioned what we mean by data science and just by listing the uh, all the tools that we use uh, is uh, uh, a way to, to provide an idea of how much interdisciplinary is uh, uh, data science. So uh, it, it becomes uh, the ideal uh, domain, the ideal uh, field to support um, uh, the, the policy making and the humanitarian sector. But what is the value for data scientists? So in the end, uh, uh, this is a, a call for action for data scientists who want to have an impact, who want to uh, contrib contribute, but they might ask, yes, but what do I get in return? What is uh, the, wh why should I be interested in uh, um, putting at service uh, my skills as a data scientist? Well, uh, first of all, a stronger societal role. Um, showing how the unique set of skills of data scientists uh, applied to um, non-traditional um, digital uh, data can really uh, show how data science uh, can, uh, um, can really be a key player uh, across academia, government, uh, industry, global agencies, and nonprofit organizations. And um, basically, uh, this is a, a way to provide uh, a, a diverse set of opportunities for data scientists uh, who want to make a difference. 
and um, also a opportunity for better funding given that um, we can basically have uh, opportunities for a very diverse uh, set of uh, institutions. Um, interest uh, in research, interest uh, in data, the fact that uh, many new, let's say, entities, many new institutions are interested in using data for very specific uh, and grounded uh, problems and um, application um, is uh, a very interesting and exciting uh, challenge for data scientists that want to, to really try and, uh, and use data uh, to, um, uh, to, to solve societal problems and uh, uh, really have an impact and uh, make a difference. And, uh, at this uh, point in time, we have the unique opportunity of creating a new generation of data scientists. And uh, especially initiatives like this uh, special uh, track in the scope of um, very visible conferences like the web conference uh, is the ideal platform to showcase uh, the possibilities that uh, young people can have for their career in uh, data science for social impact and uh, the fact that they become really ambassadors of data science in all sectors and specifically in the humanitarian development uh, um, sector uh, creating new collaborations creating new uh, opportunities is uh, across uh, many different uh, areas. So this is uh, um, really a, a new horizon, especially for young people that uh, um, start their training in data science that should motivate them to not only focus uh, on uh, the methodologies and tools, but really on these new exciting uh, applications that can have an actual uh, impact. And, uh, as data scientists, going back to the, the circle of social good that I showed at the beginning, we are basically here. We are uh, the node that connects uh, data owners and problem owners, and we are the node that can unlock this, uh, this dialogue that uh, um, somehow in the end will have the real impact on uh, uh, societal challenges and, and problems. And we have to be the translators and the uh, brokers between uh, data providers, data owners, those who collect data for profit and uh, um, let's say keep them from uh, uh, being exploited for social good, and those who instead have urgent uh, problems that can be tackled by the exploitations of this data. Recently, a very uh, interesting uh, solution, let's say, uh, for um, creating these uh, rings of collaborations uh, has been um, initiated by the Governance Lab, the GovLab, which is uh, a, um, a, a think tank uh, group uh, at the um, New York University, led by Stefan Verhuls, that was initially created during the Obama administration. Um, and that uh, um, is um, that has really at, at the goal at the heart of uh, of their goal uh, the creation of pub, uh, public private partnership models to bring participants from different sectors, in particular companies, to exchange their data to create public value. Um, I see that there is a question. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Ricardo. Bye bye. <laughs> Um, and these uh, data collaboratives uh, have been uh, active uh, since um, a few years uh, and have been very successful in uh, generating public value around uh, uh, privately uh, owned data. They have um, a, a large, uh, uh, let's say, range of uh, different uh, focus areas. And uh, we might uh, want to highlight uh, the specific um, area devoted to research and insights, which might be of uh, interest for uh, this community. Um, and uh, the data, the, um, the GovLab uh, Data Collaboratives Initiative has uh, also led to uh, data for COVID-19 
which is uh, a, um, a series of uh, projects initiated by the GovLab with several philanthropic partners uh, and, uh, but not only, even academic partner to uh, identify, collect and analyze um, the value that data can provide uh, about the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And this is uh, uh, one of the first examples of how different initiatives by different uh, institutions can be uh, brought together to show what can be done with data to have an impact on responding and mitigating the uh, data, the um, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, in particular, um, another, um, let's say, uh, specific data collaborative initiative that I would like to mention is the one around mobility. These are a series of uh, studies of uh, works that have been created around uh, data sets um, related to mobility provided by a company called Cubic. So, sorry, the very first one uh, has a focus on um, several countries in Europe, like uh, Italy and, uh, and Spain, and has been um, done by a research, uh, two research groups, one at ISI Foundation and one uh, in um, uh, Balearic University in Palma de Mallorca. And uh, the, uh, let's say, um, common uh, um, piece is the fact that uh, uh, these uh, research groups have had access to uh, mobility data provided by a company uh, called Cubic that uh, uh, is basically focusing on um, uh, position intelligence, on, um, uh, let's say, inferring the position of individuals that use uh, uh, mobile phone apps. And this company has um, agreed to provide uh, uh, fluxes of mobility, so how people move around in space, um, as inferred by the usage of their mobile phone during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, these, uh, these kind of data are crucial, really uh, are the, the backbone of uh, uh, mathematical models that study the um, spreading of infectious diseases and in particular uh, COVID-19. And what they did was to, to use uh, mobility of individuals to try and see uh, how individuals changed their mobility, their contact, uh, during the pandemic to then simulate how this has um, impacted the, the spreading of the disease and uh, um, how um, the, um, the fact that people diffuse in, uh, in space can lead to multiple outbreaks of the uh, disease in a very short amount of time. And another interesting study has been uh, focusing on uh, um, the United States, uh, led by Esteban Moro and Alex Pentland, and uh, again with the uh, data from Cubic, where uh, they also shed light on income segregation uh, to show how uh, mobility patterns uh, um, can uh, uh, really um, make uh, um, inequalities uh, emerge uh, in a very clear and efficient way uh, uh, with uh, a, a, a precision that no other traditional data set uh, can provide. And finally, an interesting study, again done by our team uh, at ISI, that showed how during the first uh, weeks of the lockdown uh, following the COVID-19 outbreak in March 2020, um, the Italian population changed uh, completely their uh, everyday habits and their mobility. Uh, and uh, they showed, uh, again, based on these uh, cubic data, how um, the uh, overall national uh, um, uh, mobility was completely shut down during the very first uh, weeks of uh, March. Um, another interesting work is uh, uh, this one uh, published on science advances uh, um, led by Mauricio Santillana the, uh, from the Harvard um, Medical School that showed how um, multiple digital traces 
ranging from uh, uh, mobile phone data, but also uh, other digital data um, generated by the usage of digital platforms uh, from the general population can be used as an early warning approach to monitor infectious diseases like, for example, uh, COVID-19. So this is just to give you an example of what uh, um, is the potential that can be unlocked by the data of just one company. And uh, it, it is really um, uh, important to stress that even just one company was able to, to really um, empower uh, these very many diverse uh, studies on a crucial uh, issue uh, like uh, the COVID-19 outbreak. And the initiatives uh, simulated by Cubic uh, um, usage of data were so many that uh, uh, the GovLab created these uh, Atlas of Inequality and Cubic's Data for Good uh, initiative. So a whole, a, a, a whole atlas of initiatives uh, related to reviewing the um, studies that the Cubic's data uh, have made uh, possible. And this is just one company. Imagine what could be done if uh, more companies with uh, more diverse data uh, would uh, um, make their data available to the research community. <coughs> this was uh, an example that um, was very successful, but that was uh, simulated by the crisis of COVID-19. What can we do to uh, establish uh, uh, data collaboratives relationships, uh, uh, training for young people uh, on a, let's say, longer term perspective without uh, uh, needing a, a, basically a global pandemic to uh, unlock this kind of um, collaborations and potentials. Well, um, at ISI, we have uh, created uh, a, a training program that we call uh, Lagrange Scholarships on Data Science for Social Impact that has been um, going on for, uh, I think, the past four years, so well before the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, the idea is that uh, uh, as a data science institution, so we try to provide uh, uh, young junior researchers with the one year of research experience uh, at the um, convergence of uh, these uh, activities, as I mentioned, uh, collaboration uh, on societal challenges, societal issues, um, made possible by um, contacts with uh, data owners, for example, Cubic uh, is one of the collaborators or companies like Telefonica, but also Facebook or, and Google, um, driven and simulated by the questions that problem owners, uh, such as global agencies uh, like uh, World Food Programme, UNICEF uh, might have. So the idea is uh, to create uh, um, projects that can be um, addressed uh, over the course of a year uh, around a specific problem that one of these global agencies uh, proposes uh, to us and uh, um, engaging uh, a data owner, uh, a private company or any actor who might provide uh, um, meaningful data uh, to address this problem. What do we do? We provide uh, the uh, scientific training and skills uh, and um, scientific framework uh, uh, to help the researchers uh, uh, address uh, the, the problem. So uh, it's, uh, let's say, the ideal uh, uh, virtues uh, uh, cycle that brings together problem owners, data owners, data scientists, and create the next generation of data scientists for social good. In the remaining uh, time of the talk, next, uh, I would say 10 minutes, I would like to um, show you, showcase some of the uh, most uh, interesting studies that we have been um, carrying out uh, uh, in, the, in the scope of these um, uh, Lagrange uh, scholarship programs. And one of the first uh, studies that we did was uh, related to uh, addressing gender gaps in uh, urban mobility. This was uh, a, a very interesting work uh, that was done by some of my colleagues that was focusing on Santiago de Chile. 
And uh, the um, uh, problem owner, let's say, was uh, UNICEF. And uh, um, under the, let's say, uh, simulation of UNICEF, we uh, tried to uh, find the data that could help us uh, address uh, the gender inequalities in mobility in uh, Santiago. So there is uh, the knowledge that uh, Santiago de Chile is a very modern and very large uh, urban area, but uh, uh, like many other cities in the world, it has a strong uh, problem related to segregation. And especially in deprived areas, the segregation uh, impacts uh, uh, differently men and women. And so um, the idea was to try and see if we could find uh, mobility related data to uh, shed a light on the problem uh, and also uh, be able to, pro to propose the solutions and, uh, um, and, um, and policies. And uh, the um, uh, interesting part is that we partnered up with the Universidad del Desarrollo, which is uh, a private university in Santiago that is also um, the, the creator of a research uh, center in collaboration with Telefonica, which is uh, the largest uh, uh, provider of uh, mobile connectivity in uh, South America. And thanks to this collaboration with Telefonica and Universidad de Desarrollo, we managed to have access to mobility data um, of a large cohort of anonymized mobile phone users. And we were able to reveal the, the, the gaps in mobility for women in deprived areas. So what is interesting uh, that um, we learned from the studies uh, from the studies that uh, in uh, uh, more affluent areas, uh, men and women move around uh, in the same way. They visit the same number of locations. They um, have uh, a mobility network that is quite similar. While in the more deprived areas, where the access to public transport or the ownership of a car. Uh, is uh, uh, less equal for men and women, you see a, a, um, a gap in mobility. Women visit fewer unique locations and uh, uh, the distribution of time spent in these locations is uh, more unequal than, than men. Women spend more time in uh, hospitals, for example, or in um, attending uh, uh, in giving care to, to, the, to the relatives uh, in the family, uh, neglecting, let's say, personal activities. So it's interesting to see that uh, in uh, um, uh, well-off areas, there is no uh, gender gap in, in mobility, while in the private areas, uh, uh, there is. So it's a, it's a double uh, inequality um, aspect. And uh, the nice thing is that uh, the um, Universidad del Desarrollo uh, started a dialogue, a collaboration with the, the uh, authorities, uh, the um, let's say city authorities of Santiago de Chile, to provide uh, uh, more information about the problem and uh, devise together a solution that could uh, somehow um, address the problem. For example, uh, enhancing public transport or uh, providing support uh, for Uber rides, uh, in uh, more deprived areas uh, and so on and so forth. So this was a, a perfect example of how research institutions, problem owners and uh, data providers could come together to study a problem and uh, provide uh, a possible solution. Um, another interesting uh, interaction that we had was with the, the international, uh, in, sorry, Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, IDMC, which is a nonprofit organization uh, based in Geneva. And uh, with them, we um, created uh, a machine learning uh, um, framework to digest digital news uh, about uh, internal displacement and uh, um, provide an automatic classification um, uh, approach as well as uh, and an information extraction related to how many people were displaced, what was the cause, when this happened. And this was a way to contribute to the monitoring platform of uh, IDMC called iDetect uh, that provides um, a, a 
really a, a website, a digital platform where uh, displacement um, events are showed, as you can see, for example, um, here in the screenshot, but also very detailed reports that are uh, given to the United Nations about uh, how uh, a diverse set of causes ranging from conflicts, uh, climate change, uh, uh, natural disasters uh, impact uh, internal displacement. And the focus on internal displacement is uh, because uh, uh, usually a um, lot of attention is given to migration following disasters or conflicts, so going from one country to the other, while internal displacement remains uh, largely unaddressed because it doesn't, uh, let's say, impact uh, other countries uh, beyond the one that is um, affected by a disaster or by a conflict. So it's important to uh, provide the timely information and digital news uh, uh, allow this, but you need uh, a machine learning framework not only to classify the news as relevant, but also to extract uh, the right information uh, about the specific uh, event. In this case, the data provider was, uh, uh, let's say, digital data um, collected from the web, in particular from the GDELT initiative um, that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, digests uh, digital news in many languages. And the problem owner uh, was uh, IDMC. Uh, finally, another interesting example was a very, very fruitful collaboration with the World Food Programme um, that was uh, at the same time the problem owner and uh, the data provider. Uh, this was a very fun and uh, interesting collaboration about um, forecasting food insecurity. So the World Food Programme uh, carries out uh, detailed uh, uh, phone-based uh, surveys uh, in uh, countries at risk of food insecurities to really monitor over time uh, um, the consumption of uh, nutrients um, in countries like uh, Yemen, uh, um, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, and so on and so forth. And this uh, uh, creates a time series about uh, the um, food consumption score, which is an indicator that the World Food Program uses to measure uh, the, the, the level of nutrients consumption in the households that they monitor. And they needed help in creating a forecasting framework to uh, somehow be able to um, predict or infer whenever a country uh, becomes at risk of uh, having uh, food insecurity. And um, this was really based on data collected by the World Food Program itself. Um, they have uh, a, a digital platform where they show these, uh, the, this data that they collect. And uh, we helped them create uh, a forecasting framework that in the end uh, proved to be quite effective, especially if the time series was, um, uh, let's say, um, detailed and long enough to be able to produce uh, forecasting uh, that were accurate. All these works have been uh, published in peer-reviewed um, uh, journals, and, uh, um, uh, and, and they, they, they really show uh, the potential of uh, collaboration between data scientists uh, and uh, global humanitarian uh, organizations. Another interesting uh, um, initiative, and uh, um, I'll try to go a bit faster, uh, is uh, the one that we created across uh, UNICEF, GovLab, and Microsoft Research. In this case, uh, um, the, um, uh, the, the problem was around uh, uh, monitoring uh, suicidal um, attitudes or suicidal ideation in India, which is a country in which the underreporting of uh, uh, suicides is uh, quite an issue. And the idea was to combine um, data from uh, uh, the overall census about, for example, urbanization, uh, population distribution, um, in combination with the search engine queries provided by Microsoft Research. The idea is that uh, uh, people who want uh, 
who think about suicide might start looking for, unfortunately, for information on how to take their life. And uh, the, the queries uh, about, uh, uh, for example, means of uh, uh, suicidal attempt um, are a good proxy of this ideation of suicide. And we have uh, shown that by uh, putting together census data with the um, uh, search engine queries, it is possible to um, have a good estimate of uh, the national uh, um, uh, statistics with respect to suicides at uh, a state level. But interestingly, there are some states in which uh, um, these uh, uh, statistics are um, overestimated or underestimated. And interestingly, they are overestimated in um, states where the rural uh, areas are more abundant and they are underestimated where, sorry, the vice versa. So the idea is that in rural areas, the access to the internet is lower. And so these kind of digital data fail in capturing well um, suicidal ideation, while on the other hand, in more urbanized states, this digital data can help shed a light on the fact that there is underreporting on this kind of data. And again, this has been published on the Journal of Medical Internet Research. Uh, the last uh, work that I would like to mention is um, uh, a work that we did in collaboration with the United Nations Global Pulse and Telefonica that was uh, aimed at um, studying, again, mobility uh, traces uh, um, in comparison with the different uh, mobility-based uh, data like census data or um, model-based uh, uh, mobility networks to try and see what was the, the best approach to model the spreading of Zika in Colombia. Zika was uh, a vector-borne disease that um, uh, spread uh, in 2016 uh, basically all over South America and uh, was of concern because uh, uh, it could uh, create uh, microcephaly in uh, newborns uh, whose mother was uh, exposed to, to Zika. And this was a nice collaboration again with the Telefonica, with the uh, UN Global Pulse as a problem owner to, um, to show how um, data science applied to mobility networks uh, generated by mobile phone data as measured by Telefonica uh, with the mathematical modeling of infectious diseases could be used to uh, choose to address which was the best way to model mobility in order to capture best the, um, uh, the spreading of Zika in, in Colombia. So I hope I have given you uh, an idea of the diverse set of par partners that can be, um, uh, let's say, involved in this kind of initiatives. We have the various problem owners uh, like UNICEF, like the World Food Program, like the GovLab, um, um, entities uh, like funders, uh, like the European Commission, but also philanthropic uh, uh, foundation like data.org or the Data2x um, uh, Foundation from the United Nations that can provide uh, the, the funding for these initiatives and the data providers. I mentioned a few, uh, specifically Telefonica and, and Cubic, but there are, and Microsoft Research, but there are many other studies where even data from uh, um, Facebook, formerly known as Facebook, you now it's Meta, uh, but also Google, but also Digital Globe is a company that um, collects uh, um, satellite images that are crucial, really fundamental in the humanitarian sector studies. So uh, the idea is that we have been really working hard in bringing together these diverse partners uh, together with scientific and academic um, entities to uh, tackle and address uh, the various problems uh, that are quite interdisciplinary, quite diverse uh, with the global scope that I just mentioned. Uh, this year, we are going to again work with the UNICEF, uh, with the UNICEF Innovation Division, for example, to study um, how poverty indices uh, um, derived by Facebook data, for example, 
can compared uh, um, can be compared uh, against uh, survey based uh, poverty indices in countries like uh, Indonesia or the Philippines uh, and also in collaboration with IMAP which is a large non governmental uh, organization um, we are going to use uh, environmental and socioeconomic data to understand uh, the evolution of uh, conflicts uh, in uh, a country like Colombia so this is uh, coming soon in the upcoming uh, uh, months what uh, have we been doing as a community? So just to close, uh, it's, uh, it's important to mention the fact that uh, uh, as a community, data scientists are really coming together with different initiatives uh, um, to provide, uh, even especially for younger generations, uh, um, a, a, a training, uh, uh, let's say, framework uh, to, to create uh, new skills, but also new collaborations and new uh, networks. Uh, for example, what was uh, um, the Data Science for Social Good uh, workshop at WWW? or other workshops like uh, uh, FAIR, uh, the, the FAIR one led by Ricardo himself, have uh, uh, merged into the Web for Good uh, special track in 2022. But also, for example, the Applied Machine Learning Days track on the AI and response to, COVID, uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Conference on Complex Systems uh, 2022, 2020, 2021, and 2022, the Network Science uh, Conference, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, I mentioned a, a very diverse set of conferences ranging from the web conference, ICWSM workshop on data for the well-being of the most vulnerable, focus on social media, and then um, complex systems and network science conferences uh, to really show how different communities are coming together to, to um, uh, produce knowledge, to produce collaborations, uh, having again in mind uh, the problem owners and, uh, and the applications. To conclude, what is the road ahead? How does our science impact society? How can we as data scientists contribute to guiding this uh, transformation? Well, Data scientists are really uh, um, uh, eclectic and can really be adapted, uh, their skills can really be adapted to uh, many situations and we can really help uh, in uh, um, creating the, the last mile between uh, decisions and policies through science. Um, can we do it? In some cases we can, but the, the possibilities are still uh, uh, quite open. We can uh, um, create access to relevant, uh, usually privately held data sources. We can create uh, cross-sector partnerships. What are the most important societal issues that we can tackle as a community? And how can we make these uh, systematic, sustainable, responsible? And I truly believe that these uh, initiatives like the, the Web for Good special track are really crucial to provide an answer to all these questions. And it's interesting to, um, to report that, for example, the World Bank at the end of 2021 created a report about the growth of data uh, and how these impacts uh, uh, development. And for this community, we can let's say, have a few key messages uh, that we can take home with us. Uh, we need to forge new social contracts for data and increase data use and reuse to realize a greater value. We need to create more equitable access to the benefits of data, foster trust through safeguards that protect people from the harm of data, and work to get, uh, toward an integrated national uh, data system. And I think that this conference, the web conference, is uniquely positioned to create at least a conversation around these issues, given that uh, it's one of the few conferences where the private sector um, through big tech companies is uh, heavily participating. And so uh, I hope that the word will spread and that uh, more um, actors and entities will come together to address these key messages. And the last thing I will show and then I will shut up is um, a, um, 
uh, a paper that came out uh, at the end of 2021, promoted by the Lancet and the uh, Financial Times Commission on Governing Health Futures uh, in 2030. And uh, again, there was uh, a focus on data. So this is the mantra that we, we, we have been repeating all over this presentation and uh, uh, related to the fact that lack of trust in how data is used remains a significant problem. There must be a shift towards ethical data collection, sharing, technology for public interest over private profit, profit and the upholding of digital rights. And I think these are key messages for this community and for this conference. And with this, I would like to conclude and thank you all for the attention and uh, I will be happy to answer all your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniela. Thank you very much. Very inspiring talk. I like it a lot. I will ask the audience, uh, if you have questions, please raise your hand uh, with, the bottom in, uh, with the bottom in the bottom <laughs> uh, or write in the chat so uh, Daniela can answer. Uh, in the meantime, we see if someone has a question. I have a question from Ricardo. <laughs> Before leaving, he <laughs> brought me a question for you, so I'm reading. So the question is, do you have any insight on how to access the ethical risk balance of social good, social good? So for example, could be good for many or bad for ours, so for our others. Um, I don't know if you have some comment on this question. Well, uh, as you might imagine, I don't have an answer to such a complex question. Uh, but uh, when uh, dealing with um, such powerful data, one always has to have in mind uh, the, um, uh, let's say, uh, side effect that you might have on people. So, for example, um, mobility data can help uh, uh, have an understanding of how people move around, uh, how people are distributed. But imagine doing this in a country where there are vulnerable populations that might be targeted by uh, hostile uh, uh, actions. Sometimes uh, shedding a light uh, on uh, vulnerable populations on different aspects might harm them. So uh, there is uh, a lot of discussion in uh, uh, what is, uh, what do we mean for good? So if it's only for the sake of uh, knowledge or of research uh, is one thing, but if we have in mind the well-being of the end users, we always have to think of what will happen when we share the knowledge uh, about uh, uh, what we have learned. So it's, a, it's actually a great question and it doesn't have a simple answer because it's, uh, it depends on the problem, on the situation, but sometimes uh, um, putting the finger on problems might expose vulnerable groups uh, if the context is not safe. And so things have to be done with a lot of um, you know, attention, especially when dealing with supposedly positive policy makers in the end might create policies that could also be harmful for some population groups. So the complex interplay across different uh, um, situations must always be taken into account. Yes, I agree. Uh, uh, any other question? Otherwise, I have a couple of more. <laughs> I don't see any raised hand. Please don't be shy. You can ask questions. So my question in the meantime um, is about uh, getting the data from private company. Um, I mean, which is the incentive that we can give to the private company to give their data? Because as a researcher, I always <laughs> We block it by a wall when I ask data right. for telephone companies or Facebook or whatever for doing research in general, let's say. And, and every time there is a problem of uh, uh, confidentiality, a problem of GDPR, a problem of they want to, they don't want to give. So I was just curious to see to understand if, um, if there is some special incentive or you think that there should be some special incentive for them to be able to data? So I think this is the million dollar question, right? <laughs> How do we convince? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yeah, how do we convince? Uh, <laughs> that is not a clear answer. <laughs> and I, I think that uh, our job is to really find the right incentives. For example, providing additional insight on their data and on their consumers, on their customers, um, might be one, or um, even a, a good relationship with the governmental institutions uh, uh, that could help uh, uh, their, I don't know, their market. Uh, but um, so far, there is no um, recipe that works for all the situations, because uh, as I said, it depends on the problem, it depends on the company depends on the kind of data that you want to share and uh, in the case of cubic uh, it was really the good relationship that um, the cubic executives had with the research groups and the fact that they were really willing to contribute to advancing the knowledge uh, and, and, the, and they had no specific return for their business other than public image i would say uh, other companies like, for example, Telefonica, in the case of the South American studies that I mentioned, they were really interested in, the, in knowing um, the insights that they uh, gained from uh, uh, the studies that we provided. The fact that they learned that the mobility um, provided by their data in Colombia works better than the mobility provided by the census, or the fact that uh, uh, the, the mobility in Santiago de Chile uh, for men and women is different so that they know that there are these biases in their data. Um, sometimes uh, in, in these cases that I mentioned, it's really the knowledge that for them is an incentive uh, because it makes the understanding of their data better. In other situations, uh, the, um, uh, the relationship was not so good. And in the end, we didn't get access to the data. And so we couldn't find the right incentive. So I think that the road ahead is uh, to really find the right set of incentives that could make these uh, interaction more systematic and more reproducible. But I think we are quite far from, uh, from that. Yes, I hope I have a better answer next year. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, because I have the same feeling as you. So maybe it's done case by case. So sometimes it's the government or the municipality. Sometimes uh, it should be enforced by the government, right? By regulations. So if you want to continue uh, to do business in Europe, you have to return not individual based data, of course, but at least uh, aggregated analytics uh, that can be uh, um, get from uh, from the data. Sometimes you need to impose regulations to get this kind of public value. But again, yeah. we are not there yet. Yeah, yeah, we're not there. And sometimes they use the GDPR as, GDPR as an excuse not to give data. Right, because exactly, exactly. The consent, we didn't give the consent. So Privacy and blah, blah, blah. blah and we balance this a little bit, okay, <laughs> okay worry you will not be persecuted by the GDPR if you give this data right. this for this reason. I don't know. Exactly. Maybe exactly. something about. Yeah. Yeah. OK. No other questions? Um, I think my two questions was already mentioned in this one, because my other question was about the privacy. So I think we already uh, discussed this. So if there are more, no more questions, I would like to ask Daniela very much. Thank you. Thank you a lot for accepting. Thank Thanks you for to you for time. inviting me and for organizing this special track, which I think is uh, super interesting. And uh, you really did a fantastic job. And let's see what happens next year. But I hope it will uh, continue to, to be a, a reference for this community. We hope. Thank you very much, Daniela, for your support for the event. And um, thank you to all the audience. And uh, see you at 9.45 for the next session, which is on uh, social media and fake news. Uh, so I hope to meet you back for in uh, half an hour, more or, less, more or less. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you again. Thank you Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.